Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, apologies for the IT issues I encountered them, and as a result, I'm a few minutes late. Um, so uh, let's get started. Um, my name is Captain Mahir Mufidi, Director of the HRSA's Division of Community HIV AIDS Programs in the HIV AIDS Bureau and HAB's Chief General Officer. I'm so happy you could join us. Uh, I look forward to an exciting time of sharing lessons learned and innovative strategies from several of our recipients on oral health care for people with HIV. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, can we have someone advance the slide? Thank you. Uh, actually, we can skip this one since I already covered it earlier today. Let's go to the next one. We've already covered that. Next one. We've already covered that. Next one. All right, right here. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and the next one. All right, thank you. So as you know, while funds from all the Ryan White programs A through D support the provision of oral health service, two programs specifically, many of you know, the dental reimbursement program and the community-based dental partnership program specifically focus on funding for oral health care and training of dental providers. Um, and today we are going to focus on and socialize several promising and exemplary work of community uh, uh, partnership dental recipients across a range of areas. Next slide, please. Uh, and to put the work of the community dental partnership into perspective, into context, this is the, this is the purpose of the, uh, the purpose of the community-based dental partnership has always been to improve access to oral health care services for low-income people and to provide education and training so it's been a great year of planning for the Part F Community-Based Dental Partnership Program. Uh, in November 2021, DCHAP hosted one of two oral health listening sessions, which brought together dental experts and recipients for the purpose of obtaining feedback and input regarding new stri uh, strategic actions or directions for the Community-Based Dental Partnership Program in order to maximize its impact in preparation of the 2023 recompetition of the program. And then we hosted a second listening session in January, 2022. And the listening sessions sought input on uh, in key areas outlined in this slide, two of which you will hear more about from today's panelists, uh, enhancing care access and medical dental integration and optimizing education and training. Next slide, please. Uh, there were a number of recommended actions, um, the feedback that emerged from the listening mm -hmm. sessions, participants emphasized the importance of increasing the community-based dental partnerships national presence, which we are doing here today, uh, allocating funding to geographic areas with highest HIV burden, which we've done through the 2023 uh, recompetition and the NOFO, and then optimizing dental education and training which again, we're, uh, it's a focus of ours for today. Next slide. And then building on the listening sessions, um, we then held the first ever part F Dental Community Based Center Partnership Program stakeholder webinar on June 8th, 2023. The webinar featured discussions on the Ryan White Oral Health uh, Data Report, promoting developing the next cadre of dental leaders uh, a discussion on challenges with integrating dental and medical EHR data, and then stories from the field demonstrating best practices in data integration. Next slide. And then we were so thrilled to feature dental colleagues um, as presenters at our inaugural Part D symposium last year, November 2023, which drew over 600 attendees in two days. And again, we've featured oral health uh, and presenters uh, 
at our October 2023 stakeholder webinar. And between both engagements, we highlighted the contributions of our dental colleagues in this forum, uh, increased visibility of oral health providers and their role in ensuring access to high quality care for people with HIV. And uh, through these engagements, you know, we are striving to achieve our goal of uh, promoting the integration of uh, our oral health partners, dental recipients in our larger Part C and D program activities and engagements. Next slide. And as mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, um, you know, our the Part F dental um, uh, collaborative, More Than Teeth, will launch in FY2000. One more slide, please. Uh, as mentioned during the plenary, our Part F Dental Learning Collaborative, More Than Teeth, will be launched in FY 2025, sometime in the summer of 2025, and focus on disseminating promising and innovative strategies, best practices, action planning, and partnership building. So I'm really, really excited about the Learning Collaborative um, and the learning exchange it will foster among uh, dental and non-dental colleagues and recipients on the integration of oral health and primary care for our HIV clients. Next slide. And next slide. One more. One more. All right, and now to the best part of the session. Uh, titled Stories from the Field, Exemplary Practices from Community-Based Central Partnership Program Grant Recipients. We, we have, um, Dr. Mark Schweitzer, Dr. Jill York, Dr. Alicia Rose Hawthorne, and Dr. Jemima Maxine Lewis here uh, to reflect with us on some of the great work they're doing in various areas of, of oral health for people with HIV. So without further ado, I'm gonna invite our next uh, presenter, Dr. Schweitzer. Good morning. I guess it's still morning, Dr. Mafidi. Thanks you for having me, and it's really great to join my panel of, uh, of distinguished colleagues. And I think you said something really important about learning and education. And I'm going to focus on learning and education today. I'm Dr. Mark Schweizer. I'm the Dean of Community Programs and Public Health at Nova Southeastern University College of Dental Medicine, and I'm the Dental Director for the Southeast AETC. Next slide, please. And just how this project has been supported, any of the contact I'm presenting does not necessarily re represent the official views of HRSA. Next slide. So what we're going to do is what I call a leading objective. And what are we trying to look at today? What are we trying to do in oral health? And the need is to really engage age all patients in oral health care with education. And it, it's well known that patients who engage in oral health, and we saw this data earlier, have greater health, a greater improvement in health outcomes than those that are not engaged in oral health. So this is really a important component of all our presentations today. Next slide, please. So we can go to the next slide, so we can, uh, for time. So, Oral health care is very unique for many reasons. I'm gonna go through this quickly. Um, we have unique relationships with our patients. You know, we work very closely with our patients. We overcome a lot of issues our patients have with fear, um, lack of education, lack of knowledge. We also see our patients in the oral health care field much more often than we do maybe in other healthcare categories. We're working hard at integrating oral health, overall health, and things for patients. And we've talked about this integration of medical and dental, and I think we're really moving forward in these bi-directional referrals. So we have a lot of opportunities. And I think the greatest opportunity we have is really for education, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Next slide, please. So uh, Dr. Mafidi really mentioned this, and it really hit me, and it hits me up learning versus education. So education is something just like we open a book, we read it, that's education. But taking that, okay, from that reading to actually learning and putting it into place is where we want to move people. So it's great to give a lecture, but how do we take that lecture and have the learner actually learn it so they put it into practice? Next slide. 
So I've been really fortunate working with the Southeast AETC and many other organizations. And I've done quite a bit of training on how to be a better teacher so I can create better learners. So I want to sort of discuss one of some of the techniques that I use for training. So I always start with an opener. So next slide, please. So an opener is something that makes an impact. And I think when you're talking about HIV, there's no greater impact than Ryan White, who, who who basically was our poster child for HIV, who died at the age of 18 of a blood transfusion. And we may think a lot of us in our field know this, but I think when you're trying to create learners, they need to know the impact that HIV has had on so many of uh, so many people that we've lost in our, our lives, those of us who are educating. So in this slide, we have people that people know. We have Elton John, we have Michael Jackson. We show the AIDS quilt in Washington, D.C. I remember standing there. At that point, there was over 700,000 deaths. So the impact is really start with something that's gonna engage your audience. Next slide. So my next thing is a refresher. And that's an activity that revises or updates one's skills or knowledge. So can we bring the whole question up, please? This is a, a great question that sort of exemplifies a refresher for us. So we have a poll here, and if everybody can participate, that would be great. So polling question, please. So we're waiting this to come up. I want to thank one of my colleagues, Debbie Sister Safer, who's at, at this meeting also. So here's, and this is one of her favorite questions, and I love this. So this basically asks how many people were taught that chicken soup will cure a cold. So we have a couple of choices. We have yes, no, yes to the soup, but no to the chicken. So can everyone please answer the question? Everybody who's on the out there in our audience, please. And we'll just take a few to see how it goes. Okay, there we go. So we have some yes, no, and yes to the soup, no to the chicken. Thank you, everyone, for participating. So next slide, please. Next slide. All right. Well, it's interesting. So we can take a slide, an easy question like asking about chicken soup. And now we've created a whole discussion about multicultural health practices. So what type of soup are we talking about? There's matzo ball soup, there's Mexican tortilla soup, there's noodle soup, there's broth. So again, something so simple as a refresher, we just ask about a normal question because we all talk about chicken soup when we're sick, creates a whole new discussion. And that's what you want a refresher to do to sort of bring everything you've taught back together. So if you're talking about multicultural health practices, which are so important when we looked at the data that Dr. Mafidi and a lot of people have presented about the, you know, the the problems we have in the discrepancies and disproportionate amount of people affected by HIV, these discussions are really important. Next slide, please. How's our slide turner doing today? Next slide, please. There we go. So the last thing you want to do is to add an evaluation. And it's very important as an educator to create learners, and you need to identify areas for improvement. So did you uh, did you create your goals? Or can we do it in a more efficient way? You know, what was effective, what wasn't effective? How do we advance learning and education? And these are really important points. I mean, you know, in the old days, when I first started teaching, you know, we had our PowerPoint, it was slide after slide, and we just read off our slides. That's education, that's not learning. And so what we want to create is, how did we do? Can we improve things? And then we always have rooms for improvement. So that's why we always have surveys and other things. So this is an important component of what you're educating. So next slide, please. So I've been very fortunate at Nova Southeastern University and with the AIDS Education Training Center to develop a four-year uh, HIV and oral health curriculum. 
And we start very early. I'm going to go through the first, second, and third years very early, uh, very quickly. So we talk about a history of HIV. We integrate it into our basic sciences, and we integrate it into our own medicine and treatment planning. And so we start in the first year because you think of the 23-year-old dental students or 22, they don't really know much about HIV. They don't understand the relationship between HIV and oral health. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna really focus on our, our fourth year. And we've developed several courses at the university and we have a, a extramural rotations. And we're very lucky to receive uh, very generous funding from both Part F and Part A. And we have an oral health care program where every se senior student spends 14 weeks in a clinical practice one day a week. And there's multiple things we do. We have lunchtime educational sessions. We have morning educational sessions. We do interprofessional practice. And we really work on not just, you know, the dental procedures, because, you know, when you look at your learner, what does the learner want to know? Well, a dental student wants to just do the procedures. But we're trying to focus on critical thinking, problem solving, interpersonal communication. So this is really a part of the rotation, and it's part of their evaluation also. They have to do a reflective journal. We have focus groups. We have presentations. Uh, we have case writing. So this is a very important part of our program to have what do the students actually learn. Uh, next slide, please. So we also have uh, in these extramural rotations. So we have a very robust Ryan White HIV program. We have our Part F community-based partnership. That's like one of my favorites. All, all of them are great because we're working with a, a local community health center. And actually what the students there is, they're actually working with both dental and primary care providers. So then that's providing dental care. They're spending time with the primary care provider maybe going over HIV test results, maybe talking about something like PrEP, or maybe re reviewing antiretroviral medications so they can see how we can integrate medical and dental in the same setting. Next slide, please. And then we do a lot of training. So we use a lot of things from the Southeast AETC. We talk about cultural humility, transgender populations. Often we have a, a person who's transgender come and talk with the students. We address HIV and homelessness. We work on you know, special populations. So in South Florida, we have a large Latinx and Latino population. We talk about hepatitis C um, and we talk about PrEP. Um, so we really add all this together. So again, you know, we're, we, we're providing dental care, but we're focusing on the important parts that they can use when they're a dentist practicing so they're gonna feel comfortable treating people with HIV. Next slide. And then we have some mandatory lectures. So I have a series that I do, HIV and oral health. We talk about oral lesions, diagnosis and treatment. We talk about art, PrEP and PEP. But I'm not, and that's a picture of our clinic there, but I'm talking to, to oral health care providers. So you have to remember your audience. I have to create a presentation that's going to reach them in a certain level. And I work with a fellow pharmacist at the university, and she does this great art presentation where she looks at it as Panda Express. So Panda Express, you go and you pick one from column A, one from column B, column C. People can remember that. That's a learning tool you can give a student that will help them remember how, to, how art is you know, given to patients. Next slide. And then we do a pre and post test. We want to see where they are at the beginning and where they are at the end. A simple oral health question, saliva is a vehicle for, for transmission in HIV. Okay. So how is that answered? Things like what's an undetectable viral load? And then we always have an open-ended question and evaluation. The, the education should include more about what would you like to know more about patients with HIV? Next slide. And then we, we end this all up. So we take everything we've had over four years and we wrap it up. And we do that with interprofessional learning in healthcare because we want students to understand how they can work with other providers. So we've created a series of modules that, that are basically uh, online. So next slide, please. 
And so the, here's these modules. They, we do an introduction to interprofessional care. We talk about HIV and oral health. We talk about pharmacological aspects of HIV. We have a psychologist talk about psychological aspects. And then once they've completed all those modules and answered a series of questions, we do an actual live case. And that case is basically, in our case, it's the case of someone I've named Mary Johnson. She's actually a real patient. And we do that in a live session. So next slide, please. I'm not going to read all the, the things, but what we're trying to do is for dental students or, or any educators or any group of people to learn how to work in a team. And given a problem-based scenario, we want to look at, you know, a diagnosis, causes, things that we can do to collaborate or evaluate and develop interventions to improve the patient's health. And in the long term, we all have the goal for patients with HIV to have them undetectable using the determination that UEQU is very important. And we look at social determinants of health, how community health education can help our patients. And I work with many other community organizations in our area to help those organizations get the message out. Next slide. Dr. Schweitzer, two minutes. Okay, I'm doing great, so great. So I'm not gonna go through the case, but this is Mary Johnson. It talks about her diagnosis, her medication list. So you can see that, they, uh, that there's a lot that they have to look at in this case. Next slide. And then they have to end it up with a reflective essay. And I'm not gonna go through all the questions, but I'm just gonna talk about two, number five, which is looking at sociocultural factors. And number seven is what oral healthcare delivery model was used and how you could incorporate this model into their professional career. Next slide. And so I was right on time, look at that. So these are just some resources. You're gonna see some of the things that I've worked on. I have an oral health quiz time on the Southeast AETC. Next slide. So I'm not gonna give you all these, but I put a lot of resources out here. So when you look at the presentation, things that may help you. Next slide. And there's some other great resources. So we have a national HIV curriculum. I have some of the uh, AETC directors out here. We actually just developed a track for oral health, which you may want to take. You can get CE credit for that. Next slide. And these are my references and last slide. So thank you all. And I'm looking forward to hearing our, our next presenters. Thanks, Dr. Mahoney. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Schweizer, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. We look forward to seeing, you know, what questions attendees have for you at the end of all the presentations. Next up is Dr. Jill York, Program Director of the Rutgers Health School of Dental Medicine Community Based Dental Partnership Program. Dr. York. Good morning, good afternoon. Today I'm going to address uh, tobacco and cessation efforts through trauma-informed care. This, ta this project and product was supported by the HRSA grant that we had received and its contents are solely the responsibility of Rutgers and does not necessarily represent the official views of HRSA. Next slide, please. This topic is of particular importance to all of us attending this conference today because trauma, tobacco, as well as uh, when, we, when we deal with people with HIV, um, we see that it is a public health issue that disproportionately affects marginalized populations. When we talk about trauma, we can talk about physical and psychological trauma, and it increases vulnerabilities to risky behavior, and that could include tobacco use. Tobacco addiction is the leading cause of chronic diseases, and it can weaken the immune system, exacerbating health challenges for people with HIV. Rutgers partnered with the National Council for Mental Wellbeing on the trauma and tobacco community of practice. And when you start any type of project, you develop your core implementation team. Next slide, please. The aim of this project, when we look along the continuum of care, is engagement in care. And we were going to transform our tobacco prevention, treatment, and control efforts in order to increase 
retention and engagement in oral care for people with HIV. We were going to create a trauma-informed, resilience and equity-oriented program that addresses the intersection of both of these topics. Next slide, please. Rutgers is well aligned to take on this community of practice due to our demonstrated strengths. In 2015, Rutgers received a grant from the American Dental Association in order to train dentists within our program to become tobacco treatment specialists. This allowed us to do counseling within our three community clinics in Southern New Jersey. In 2018, we implemented a trauma-informed approach to care. We were the only dental program in the state of New Jersey to be a participant in the New Jersey HIV Trauma-Informed Care Project. Over the years, our employees have received over 40 hours of training. But without no doubt, un underpinning all of our efforts is that patients are welcomed and respected regardless of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or health status. Next slide, please. When we took on this process of investigation, and um, it was very well explained in the open plenary on what a community of practice is, there were two questions that we wanted to address. How can the clinics ensure a trauma-sensitive environment for our patients seeking tobacco cessation services? And then what strategies can we employ, evidence-based best practices to integrate trauma-informed principles into our tobacco cessation program? Before initiating, we all must take the time to assess our internal and our external environment. What is the context by which we are going to be embarking upon this project? Imagine embarking upon a journey without understanding the landscape. Next slide, please. In 2015, we undertook a survey and the, the N was 154. And these were new patients that were walking into our clinic doors. And what was so startling is that only 6.5% of the dentist of, of the patients had had a dentist offer them counseling before. 63% said that they were interested in counseling by a dentist. Next slide, please. Again, we have to look at what is going on in our internal environment. So we had implemented a trauma-informed care program and we had a tobacco cessation program and we were on this community of practice that we wanted to embark upon. So we looked at cigarette use, anxiety, and HIV. And a review of the electronic health record was done. What we had found out is that our patient population that used tobacco was above the national average at this particular time, which was at that time 11.5%. And that was from the CDC. Our HIV population was well below the national average at 34, which is 34 to 47%. But what we have found out when asking our patients in depth more, because this was a paper, you know, electronic health record, we had uncovered that our patients actually do smoke, but they didn't consider it smoking when they were only doing it when they were having dinner with friends or at a party. So we have much more tobacco use than we had really on paper. And then we looked at anxiety and there was this high incidence of people with anxiety that actually used uh, tobacco. Next slide, please. What we can conclude uh, from what we had looked at is that adults with HIV are more likely to smoke and less likely to quit. So now we would go ahead and look at demographics, social dynamics, and environmental factors because these two would influence whether someone uses tobacco. We had not done this in 2015 when we initiated that in-house tobacco counseling. So we looked to the data and what we had seen is that if you, we looked at it by age. 
So in this particular graph, we notice that people that are over the age of 65 don't really have as much mental uh, distress as those that are under the age of 65. Next slide, please. We then looked at it by race, and we can see there was a greater percentage of those who are Hispanic that mental distress played a role in their tobacco use, as is the white population. And it, it also somewhat affected slightly the African-American Black population. Next slide, please. We again looked at it by gender, and we see that it it, it, it increased dramatically for those that are male. So we have more males that have mental distress that utilize tobacco use to try to ease up on their stress or, or other factors that are causing them to smoke. Next slide, please. We then turn to the CDC, and we all know that social and environmental factors play a role. So we can see in this particular slide that those individuals that were unemployed had a greater prevalence of smoking, and the next slide, please, and those that made less than $25,000. The whole purpose of this exercise to show you this information is not for you to understand what is going on in the state of New Jersey, but to show you that education, all of these social factors that we oftentimes don't take into account when we're trying to help someone quit, quit smoking, do play a role. And you really need to really understand how these elements interact in order to guide you in the development of your strategy or intervention to reduce tobacco use amongst patients and therefore to uh, anticipated health risk reduction. Next slide, please. We then looked at when we started this project, what did we think we were going to accomplish? We were going to enhance access to care, increase patient engagement, improve patient satisfaction. We wanted to have a holistic approach to patient care and have a patient-centered approach. We wanted to increase our care coordination. We wanted to develop more community projects. And most importantly, one of the things that we thought we could accomplish in this whole thing is decrease preventable differences in oral health affecting certain groups of people more than others. And that's pretty uh, a startling thing. We're taking on equity now in our tobacco program. Next slide, please. This here is our intervention. And what this represents is um, an educational model where each column is a focus of our curriculum development. And what our ultimate goal is to really develop a compassionate, inclusive, and effective tobacco sensation program that supports the long-term health and wellness for all communities. Next slide, please. Our biggest successes in our inter intervention impl implementation was we had very strong leadership and organizational buy-in. We needed uh, to get individuals that were at the ground level, uh, those individuals at the front desk. Um, th there's a whole number of things that we tried to get involved. And then we did our homework and we identified best practices and evidence-based um, procedures in order to develop our tobacco cessation program. But ultimately our biggest accomplishment was the development of this educational model that will target faculty and students, staff, and patients. We know that addiction is very uh, a very challenging thing, especially with nicotine. We know our population has increased stress and mental health issues. We truly understand that the environment and social factors play a role, and our population has many competing priorities. And some of our patients even believe this is a Herculean task and they need as much support as they possibly can. Next slide, please. Our lessons learned is that the success hinged on three fundamental components, a clear vision and objectives, and you need to communicate that to everyone on, that's within the organization. We had effective leadership and staff engagement, and we really did develop a resilient change management approach with the help of the National Council. It's essential to assess your environment and to identify potential barriers. 
and then to develop a clear implementation strategy to ensure successful integration and a meaningful impact on patient care. When we were to draw upon our community of practice, we prioritized and will continue to prioritize early engagement with people with lived experience. And you really need the help of the community organizations to really get their input into embracing diverse viewpoints and cultivating support from all stakeholders involved. Next slide, please. The next steps as we launch our curriculum is explore opportunities to leverage technology. We really need to continue to enhance patient engagement and participation. And then we had some generic or general uh, outcomes. We really need to develop smart goals and, and, and see what how are we going to uh, track what we've done. Next slide, please. This right here is a change management process that you at your organizations can, can get started with. Develop a core implementation team, conduct a clinic assessment, build on your opportunities, uh, see where you stand, really get involved in understanding evidence-based and best practice, work smarter, not harder. Things have already been accomplished by others. Identify champions within your organization. Leadership cannot do it alone. Align your tobacco cessation efforts with trauma-informed initiatives. You need stakeholders. You need to engagement and support from everyone inside and outside of your organization, and then develop a plan and monitor it. In conclusion, addressing tobacco use and cessation through trauma-informed care offers a compassionate and effective approach to support individuals in their journey, especially people with HIV, toward better health. By integrating trauma awareness into our sensation programs, Rutgers not only enhanced the intervention, but what we did is we created an environment that is supportive and empathetic for all that we want to serve. Thank you very much and I'll answer your questions at the end. Please put them in the chat. Next slide. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Alicia Rose Hathorn. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I serve as the principal investigator of a community-based dental partnership grant at the University of Mississippi Medical Center School of Dentistry within the Department of Advanced General Dentistry. Next slide, please. So our look at the dental team's role in the referral cycle today will focus on dentistry as an unmet need uh, the dental's role in the referral uh, cycle in the HIV care continuum uh, to improve the quality of life. We will also discuss what our team developed to help streamline our external referral process and our initial stages of an outreach engagement project uh, and the challenges that we, uh, that we encountered. Next slide, please. So unmet need in dentistry is highlighted by a multitude of reasons, uh, the inability to afford dental insurance or lack of insurance through a job. Uh, some have traumatic experiences as a child that resonates a lifetime. Uh, dental anxiety and fear uh, certainly pushes many patients to procrastinate uh, going to the dentist and getting their needs uh, seen about. Uh, and also difficulty with transportation and lack of referral options from a primary care source and clinic. Next slide, please. So the state of Mississippi was included in a 2020 CDC medical monitoring project, uh, encouraging numbers that were included that around 56% of those patients who were asked did report that they received dental services. Uh, we still see that there were 21% uh, reported an unmet need for dental care. Uh, for the state of Mississippi, uh, we didn't have as many participating uh, that were originally sampled, but we still see that we have a need uh, that we need to try and, um, and fulfill. Next slide, please. So another medical monitoring project in 2021 pooled dental need in with the social determinants of health and quality of life among adults with HIV. Uh, looking at the table, you can see the number of participants in each age group, 
uh, with really younger patients identifying a dental uh, a yes to an unmet need at over 50%. Uh, the older generations uh, do not report as much as over 50%, but right under that. Next slide, please. So what can dentistry do for the patient? Uh, eliminating pain and restoring function are our primary goals uh, and roles in addition to identifying oral cancer lesions, but we also want patients to be involved in their care and understanding the role that our, their teeth and their gum tissue play in with their overall health. Uh, when they are provided uh, a dental education overview, seeing, uh, being consistent with hygiene appointments, seeing residents or dental providers in our clinic, uh, they do begin to make wiser choices um, and understanding uh, where that where that's going to lead them. Uh, and so they become more active in their, their overall health. Uh, it's a very rewarding uh, result for our dental team. Next slide, please. So for the primary care team, uh, the dental team can be a welcome dancer in un difficult uncertainty. Uh, can a tooth be saved? Uh, has the patient's nutrition been affected with fewer teeth? Uh, and having a home base uh, for that patient uh, with dental needs, um, the team can provide referrals for specialty clinics. Does the patient need an oral surgeon due to anxiety and needing IV sedation? Uh, does the patient need a periodontist uh, to, to help with surgical intervention? Uh, does the patient need a, a root canal that may have um, very complex uh, pulpal anatomy. So uh, with these multiple uh, goals and uh, looking for the patient, um, the dental team can provide that for uh, your primary care clinic. Um, also with multiple comorbidities and medications that patients are, that they contend with, the oral environment can become very dry and irritating. Tissues can change very quickly. So dentistry can uh, assist in helping with these medical side effects and to collaborate with medical staff on how to manage the patient's oral health needs. Next slide, please. So look at the man in the picture. Um, you do not care that he is missing an eyebrow, only that he is missing uh, his front tooth. Uh, teeth not only contribute to a great smile, but are also are a necessity to begin the process of digestion, um, speech to articulate our thoughts and needs and, um, you know, going out in public and just having uh, uh, that self-esteem. Uh, and also uh, we look younger with appropriate lip support and feel better that when we are benefiting from a great overall quality and healthy lifestyle. Next slide, please. So oral health is recognized as a core medical status, putting dentistry on the front line, uh, improving our health, patient's health knowledge of how to put, put the pieces of the puzzle together and keep them on a path of wellness. Uh, it does keep them engaged and successfully connected to all of their care teams um, and keeping the continuum thriving. Next slide, please. So where to look for dental collaboration? Uh, is your clinic uh, near a dental school? Um, always look to the educational aspect of dentistry. Um, where is there a hygiene program nearby? Uh, do, are there any postdoctoral residency programs, an AEGD or a GPR close to you? Not all of these educational components uh, have to be uh, identified with a dental school. Um, is there a community health clinic nearby that hosts dental students or residents through um, external rotations? Uh, look at your state health department also. Identify uh, their centers uh, or any of those centers. Uh, do they have any dental capacity? Uh, reach out to your state's organized dental association. Do they know of dentists who can provide free or low cost dental care for your patients? And you also may be surprised at the number of private practitioners in your area that, you know, will would want to help with a patient in need. Many of those private practitioners may have actually completed an AEGD or a GPR. Uh, and so they, they are, uh, they've got that education uh, with treating uh, medically complex patients. Next slide, please. So uh, from our 2023 site results, uh, our clinical finding noted our need to improve referrals uh, from outside of our parent institution. 
Uh, the majority of our referrals comes from our co-located Part C program, which does send us the bulk of our referrals. So we had to look at ways to engage external clinics um, in our area. Next slide, please. So we developed a policy for new outside referrals. Uh, when the referral is sent, we confirm receipt of the referral and add it to uh, a developing sales spreadsheet. Uh, we contact the patient and we make them an appointment. Uh, once that appointment is made and completed, uh, we close the loop by sending a confirmation to the referring clinic uh, with clinic details. You see that we have uh, tried to look at if a patient does not answer, um, what is our next step to making sure that that patient is not, um, not forgotten so that we continue to uh, make some attempts to get that patient in. Next slide, please. Uh, so to make the process as streamlined as possible, we started with our IT support. Uh, they gave us a new grant specific email address uh, accessible by all of our staff. Uh, we developed and published uh, two educational pamphlets for clinics uh, to give to their patients. And uh, we also initially identified three local urban area clinics uh, and met with their team uh, and nurses uh, and their managerial staff. Uh, we introduced um, ourselves and provided the printed materials for dispersal in their clinics. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a quick look at our spreadsheet. We don't want any part of the referral process to uh, be missed. So uh, having contingencies that we do uh, include date of initial contact and maybe in a, a second or a third attempt. Uh, and then sometimes we do need to uh, send back and, and ask for that referring clinic uh, for some help to see if we can get that patient in. Uh, next slide, please. So the three clinics that we initially identified were uh, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation and the Open Arms, which are both uh, 501c3 organizations in our city, uh, and then also a local hospital's infectious disease clinic. Um, they are all located in Jackson. And some clinics did tell us that they do send patients to other dental clinics. Uh, and we simply wanted them to uh, let them know pretty much that we are here and just as an alternative, um, if they need anything that we're here. Uh, slide 16. Okay, next slide, please. So we made our pamphlets very simple uh, and easy to read with bullet points of information and our contact numbers. Uh, so for the clinical staff, we had a single good quality brochure front and back that highlighted our services. So here I have this one. Um, you know, this is just for the providers, just something that just front and back, very, very simple um, and with our contact information. So for our future patients, what we did is uh, we had a quality single fold brochure, uh, covered services and our contact. But also what we did is um, when they open it up, there are just a couple of pearls of wisdom uh, talking about hygiene, nutritional and dental habits. And if uh, they get called in a dental emergency, what to do. Next slide, please. Um, so this is what I kind of just showed you. Um, this is just the front of the, the brochure for the clinic staff just some basic information about who we are, what we do, and what we provide for their patients. Next slide, please. Okay, and so here is the, 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 the single fold for patients. Um, you know, hygiene, good nutrition and dental habits, emergencies, and the covered dental services for them. Uh, letting them know that, um, you know, we are here and also giving our email address as well with our phone numbers. All right, next slide, please. So our referral form to these external clinics is just some basic. We ask um, the, who is referring uh, the patient to us, the initial referral date for our spreadsheet, um, some demographics, and if the patient is in pain, um, we do run a student-ran um, emergency dental clinic every day from Monday through Friday uh, from one to five, and then our address and information. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, some challenges, um, you know, this is um, new for us to, uh, you know, be looking at uh, opportunities for what we are doing. So the challenges that we have encountered, uh, there is a co-located dental clinic um, housed by our State Department of Health um, with uh, Part B funding. And so 
we just want to make sure that the patients are seen. Uh, we have worked with them um, in the past with if they have a need, uh, we certainly will help them and vice versa. Um, so there, there's um, uh, a lot of transportation issues with patients. Uh, Mrs. The state of Mississippi is very rural and some patients travel uh, up to one or two hours to see us, to come see us. So that always has been a challenge uh, for our clinic. And then our stigma related privacy issues. Uh, some patients do make their appointments but a lot of times uh, they may not eventually come because they are concerned of who they may see when they uh, get to our clinic and sign in. Um, and so those, those are continual challenges for us. Um, so we are wanting to uh, identify and make a new contact every quarter with a, a new external clinic, eventually branching out to outside of the Jackson metro area. And then also our uh, future plans are to attend our health department's uh, HIV planning council uh, to see how we can make a difference and how we can improve our outreach. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Here's my email address if y'all have any questions and looking forward to the end. Thank you. Uh, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Jemima Louis from Jacoby Medical Center, and I'll be discussing how leveraging Ryan White's HIV AIDS program funds allowed us to expand our dental services. I'd like to thank Carissa for the opportunity here so we could showcase what we actually do. Next slide, please. So this product um, and project was funded by HRSA. It's contents are sort of the responsibility of myself and Jacoby Dental and do not necessarily represent the official views of HRSA. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, Jacoby Dental is 11-1 trauma center in the Bronx. Our dental department offers a wide range of dental services under six accredited residency programs, including general practice residency, pediatrics, dental public health, oral surgery, dental anesthesia, and craniofacial orthodontic fellowship. A subset of our department exists in um, the Adult Comprehensive Services Clinic, which mainly, which mainly treats our HIV AIDS patients. The specialized clinic was established in the 1980s and Dental became part of the team in 2005. And overall, the clinic um, serves approximately 2,500 patients. Next slide. So during that time, dental saw patients two days a week in the specialized clinic and offered comprehensive and advanced prosthetic and surgical procedures under the guidance of one dentist and 10 rotating general practice residents. But we found that our wait times for appointments were greater than six months and thus not addressing patient concerns and needs and their overall dental health efficiently. Next slide, please. So with this in mind, we applied for a grant for focus on improving access to care. We were awarded $300,000 and that allowed us to become full-time, meaning that we were there five days a week with two new dental attendings and a dental assistant slash program manager. Our referral base increased as well as the awareness of operational inefficiencies, which then led us to the application for capacity development. And then with this grant, we got up, we got upgraded dental chairs with TV monitors for um, patient education and anxiety reduction. We also got temperature and humidity cabinetry to help with on-site instrument storage. We also ordered some more dental instruments and armamentarium to meet the need of the increased number of patients we had been seeing. Next slide. So it's actually one of my favorite slides because this highlights just some of our success stories. It's one of our patients who came with a failing and compromised dentition, which not only impacted his dental health, but his mental health and self-esteem. The patient underwent comprehensive exam, implant planning and surgery, and is now fully restored and a lot happier and is now actively involved in his care and has a newfound trust in himself as well as our dental team. Next slide. So as a first-time recipient and manager of these grants, I learned that it takes an inordinate amount of time and follow-up to navigate instrument, armor return, and equipment procurement. 
navigating different hospital entities and ensuring we have shared goals and objectives was also another lesson learned. With respect to next steps, what I'm looking forward to is potentially considering clinical expansion. Um, we are working on figuring out other mod modalities to help with anxiety reduction and patient management, as well as digitization of our dental workflow and improving access to care for our patients. Next slide. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, our presenters, uh, Dr. Uh, Maxine Lewis, Dr. Uh, Rose Hawthorne, Dr. York, and Dr. Schweizer. Excellent, excellent presentation with lots of helpful and informative in information. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer Jew will moderate the rest of the session. I'll be logging off a few minutes early before 1.15 so I can make it to the uh, meet and greet at, at, at 1.30. Hopefully I can see some of you there. Uh, Jen, I'm passing the, the mic on to you. Great, thank you, Captain Mafidi. Um, I am here and I believe my video is showing. Great, okay. So before we begin our Q&A session, we would like to thank our presenters for addressing this timely and interesting topic. At this time, we will pose questions from attendees that we have been collecting throughout the presentation. Please note that you may still submit questions using the chat feature. Questions should be relevant to the scope of today's presentation. If you have questions directly related to your specific program and today's topic, we ask that you discuss that with your project officer following the conference. So one of the first questions we had was, is there any reason solely based on CDC, CD4 count and HIV viral load while oral health surgeons can refuse care, um, usually as extractions or alveoplasty for people with HIV. So I would pose this to any of the presenters and if you can come back on camera um, yeah. while you, that would be great. Sure, I'd be glad to answer that and then my other participants. So the answer is no. We have to really remember this important fact that we have one in seven undiagnosed with HIV. So whether we know it or not, we're, we're treating patients with HIV that have may have very poor outcomes or have high viral loads or low CD4. So it really makes no difference. There's no scientific evidence to support this. Um, we utilize, and I think for most of us, we do the same thing. The viral load and the C4 are a way to teach our patients. It's a way for them to learn, to stress the importance that they're remaining undetectable, that it keeps them healthy. But it will take a rare, rare, rare circumstance for a patient uh, with HIV to not be treated for an extraction uh, without a, with a with or without a viral load or a high viral load or a low CD4, it really makes no difference, and especially for emergencies. I mean, the risk of not treating the emergency or treating not treating an extraction that needs to be done, that risk is much higher than the, the related to their viral load or the CD4. So I think in my 40 years of doing this, maybe once or twice that there was another circumstance in addition to the viral load in CD4. Uh, maybe they had a really, you know, a really large infection and we had to get them on antibiotics. So we delayed care, but we would never uh, deny care based on anything in oral health, at least with our current knowledge now. But it still goes on as I'm sure all of us here. Someone else want to chime in or? Dr. Gabriel, you have your that's a great response. Uh, we can move on to the next question. Uh, Dr. York, I hear that you've conducted a webinar on oral health and trauma-informed care. Folks were saying it was a great training. Would you mind speaking on that a little bit in case other attendees are interested? Yes. Um, 
Thank you for the question. So what this um, what I presented today was a community of practice. And what it was supposed to display is a lot of times we have to build on our past accomplishments. So Rutgers began with a trauma-informed care curriculum that focused in on all of what SAMHSA had promoted and its principles. And then how do you implement that in your practice? And that again, as I had stated today, you have to look at the internal and external environment. Um, that means that you had to do an organizational assessment, an environmental assessment, you know, what is going on, which meant your you know, physical environment. Um, so yes, that, that was a webinar that was given um, out of the AIDS Education Training Center in New England. And um, that is available online. And that is something that if you're in the early stages of developing trauma-informed care, that would be very beneficial to you. But what today was presentation on is building on your past accomplishments and that, that showing you that you need to partner with others. You need to partner with um, outside of your own organization to develop a very comprehensive and thorough program. Thank you. Um, for Dr. Schweizer, could you talk more about your AETC partnership in particular? Yeah, the so, yeah, so I, I hopefully some of us are on the discussion, but uh, the, I, most of the AETC's directors I've known for many years, some are actually my mentors. So that's been sort of great and they've worked with me on various projects, but um, what we've seen is when you look at the national HIV curriculum, which is, is a, they've done a wonderful job. It was very difficult to pull out the parts that went to oral health. So we spent about, I guess, a year or so as a, as a group, all the directors from the AETC dental portion, and we went through the whole curriculum um, ad nauseum sometimes, I would say. But we reviewed every component and we picked out the components that really best fit someone who really wanted to relate to oral health and HIV. So it, it's really great. You can take it, uh, Helene, Dr. Abel, I may forget a few people, so it's not intentional, but I, Helene, we, I work with them extensively. Dr. Abel was actually my mentor. That's how I sort of got into this. But I, we sat together and we went through this and you basically can follow a track. And I've, this is one of the pieces that I didn't mention that I've given to my students. So in addition to doing all the other pieces, every student is required to complete uh, the this oral health track on the natural HIV curriculum. I think as we move forward, we're, our hope is this is step, step one, but an additional step, we develop you know, something a little more specific to oral health that's a little more aimed. There's some complicated components to this training, but I think it does give people a really good look at oral health and HIV. So it was a great project and we're hoping as a group to uh, do additional projects based on that. Great, thank Any you. Any other questions for that? Um, well, you know, we do have a question for Dr. Hawthorne. Uh, do you use great. part of dental reimbursement? Uh, no, not currently. Um, our department used to um, uh, have one uh, for Part F reimbursement. Um, we are a very small clinic, and so we currently do not uh, do any Part F reimbursement. Um, no. Yeah, just a quick follow-up question, Jen, if I may, uh, for Dr. Hawthorne. You know, um, I remember years ago when I was a project officer, I did a side visit to your program probably like 12, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it, always it was, um, you know, some, you know, challenges in terms of collaboration, partnership between the part F and, and part C. So very briefly, I mean, what have been some key successful factors that have enabled, um, you know, the narrative to change, the reality to change from non-collaboration to close collaboration between part F and part C? Um, I think one, um, originally, Dr. Mafidi, when you came to visit us, we were actually housed within the uh, part B dental clinic. Um, we made a turn in 2010 and moved um, our clinic down one floor below uh, the ADAP clinic. Uh, and then that put us closer to the part C. And I think just 
Uh, even though that we're in the same building, uh, we started reaching out to them a little bit more. We were able to have dental students and dental residents now in our clinic, whereas before we were unable to have um, any educational component uh, upstairs in the health department clinic. Uh, so I think that that has been just the biggest improvement in our collaboration is uh, actually just changing the physical location and then adding those students and residents coming through has been uh, very, very helpful. You know, we do now have a senior rotation where senior students do come to uh, with us to the OR. There are some of our HIV patients that we have taken to the operating room to uh, have their needs done and completed in one, um, in one at one time. Uh, but then also those students um, do uh, spend a, a half day uh, with Part C and they, they shadow um, the providers in Part C um, being able to um, watch and see what they do with patients coming in, either case management or uh, seeing nurse practitioners or the physicians. So I think that that's been uh, probably the biggest help for us is um, having those students and residents in with our clinics and we're able to be closer to Part C because of that. Thank you. Um, another ask or question that came up was whether there were any good lunchtime learning topics that attendees could participate in on these topics or your work. Uh, I could take that. So if you go on to the AIDS Education Training Center site, there's a lot of lunch and learns that, that are done. Um, I know that in the Southeast, we do what's called a Multicultural Monday. We do a webcast Wednesday. And so if you go on site, you'll see the schedule for a multitude of topics related to HIV. And I think the other AETCs also have you know similar events. Um, I know like if you go on like some of the sites, um, they have, you know, Facebook pages that will mention the different events that they have. Uh, some of the directors are on LinkedIn. So, you know, if you connect with the, you know, the AETC directors, that, that could be really helpful, I think, for people to look at. But there's great topics, varied topics, you know, really very interesting. And they're all um, targeted to things that the provider can take you know, with them. For example, I'll give one on retention and care. And you go, why would an oral health care provider do that? But there's tips and tricks that I think we can learn in an interprofessional environment that we can use to help our patients. And that's the overall goal. Anybody else want to hit that up? Sure. I'll oh, this is Dr. Schweizer. Uh, yeah, so last week we just completed a lunch and learn uh, in person uh, at our facility. Uh, we invited Part C and our new external, uh, the, the three external clinics that we have reached out to, uh, we invited uh, their staff. Um, and so it was just an ability for the four of us, uh, our grant administrator, our dental hygienist, our dental provider, and myself, we all just got up there and uh, provided some information about eligibility and uh, uh, discerning uh, urgent pain from emergency care, um, how to do just a quick intraoral exam from the medical perspective uh, with just your eyes and a tongue blade, just something simple that um, that a, a person can do um, to kind of figure out whether we need to be uh, notified immediately whether that patient needs to be seen that day or not. Um, hygiene, um, giving them uh, some uh, visuals of, hey, here's a smile and this, here are some things that uh, may um, may need to uh, have some someone address it. So uh, those are things that we do also with in-person. But the uh, Dr. Schweizer's, the AETC, they have a tremendous amount of um, uh, information out there that's fantastic also. Dr. Rose, that was really great. It's Dr. Schweizer again. So I think she really hit on something very important, Dr. Rose, is that we need to give tools to non-oral health care providers that they can use. So, you know, people come into a case manager or, or anyone and they, you know, they may say, I have dental pain. Then these people don't know what to do. So it just that thing about the tongue blade, oral exam, that, that's a fabulous idea. I'm going to steal it from you. Sorry. <laughs> You're, you're welcome to, you're welcome to. 
Jennifer, I I want to add too. This is Jill York. Um, a lot of times we we talk about the AIDS Education Training Center. They're a very good resource. But what we had done is we had done um, a lunch and learn with our staff, and we actually reached out to the Northeast and Caribbean Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Center. Sometimes you have to go outside the box. And when the opioid epidemic, you know, was hitting hard in New Jersey, uh, we brought those individuals in and they used their expertise to give us some signs as to maybe what we can spot in a patient or when they answer a question a particular way that they can be seeking help. So I just wanted to put that out there. You have you can get very creative in your lunchtime and also in your continuing education that you provide for your faculty, staff and students. Jill, that's really a great point, because I think one of the things when you ask people in the oil care, well, what are the new things we're facing? I think it's opioids and I think it's, you know, substance abuse. I think it's starting to, uh, in some ways, interfere with our ability to provide the care that we want. So I think that's a great point that, you know, again, you have to reach beyond oral health. I think that's very innovative that you all you know, looked at that factor. And it's something I think we're all going to have to look at now and in the future. So some great ideas here. Thank you. Uh, question for all the presenters. Uh, how have you engaged people with HIV in your programs? You said HIV, correct? Good, thank you. Okay, well, you know, getting into the community, I think, you know, being a oral health care provider or just a provider in HIV is just not limited every day to what you do. You've got to get community engagement. So I speak at multiple agencies. I'm on the Broward County uh, HIV Planning Council. I get, I'm on the Priorities Committee. We, I'm on an oral health network. I work with senior organizations. So I, I think you know, the, the way you engage clients is community. And I think that I had mentioned before, I think oral health care is unique because we we create a relationship with our patients. And when once a patient trusts you, you you have gained so much in helping them, you know, stay healthy. So I think it's community engagement and then, you know, word of mouth. I mean, it's it's like being in private dental practice. If you provide good care and you the patients know that you care and you address HIV things in your dental practice. Just one of the quick things that we do at every visit, we ask the patient, did you take your antiretroviral therapy today? It's just a question that shows that you're reaching beyond just there for a teeth cleaning or a teeth filling. And I think those type of things mean a lot to our patients. Anyone else, I guess? Yeah, yeah so I, I agree. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I agree with Dr. Tricer. So we do, at Jacoby, we have a lot of community health fairs. We have a community advisory board, which dental attends meetings to figure out how we can improve and what we need to work on for them. And um, with respect to word of mouth, like, oh, we don't, we don't necessarily advertise, but the patients who come to see us know patients who need to have care or have gone somewhere else and didn't receive like adequate care or they felt like stigmatized and stuff like that. So they usually end up referring the patients to us. So I think it's just it's showing compassion and all that stuff is how we end up keeping our patients and also keeping our referral base open. Hi, this is Jill York. Um, we're we're in New, in the state of New Jersey. We're developing something that's quite uh, different and trying to gauge people. So uh, the state of New Jersey has uh, worked with the AIDS Education Training Center at Rutgers School of Nursing, and Dr. Stephen Toth and I are co-chairing a, a a dental subcommittee where we're going to be developing non-dental champions. And so we're going to be utilizing the non-dental champions, which are all of the Ryan White funded agencies in the state of New Jersey, to engage patients in care. And we meet with them quarterly and we try to get a sense of where our patients stand, what they need, what our providers need. Um, we're looking at a whole gamut of um, different topics. And so we're on the verge of putting that all together as a best practice. But I think we really need to engage our clients in their own care. They have to, we have to use trauma-informed care to empower them, giving them voice choice. And, and we really need to meet them where they are. 
So um, I agree with what all of my colleagues said today, but um, I think we're going to be trying to get a little more innovative um, than just the dentist going out in the community. We're going to be utilizing others uh, to do exactly that. Thank you. Dr. Louie, I was interested to hear more about the different modalities you're exploring for anxiety. Uh, have you found some that are more successful or ones you're eyeing? So right now in the clinic that we are in, we didn't have any um, nitrous. And um, the Jacoby has two main clinics. We have the main clinic on the third floor, and then we have a clinic for the HIV patients. So we're basically trying to get that clinic downstairs to look like the clinic we have upstairs with respect to just having... Um, capabilities for music and like a more soothing chair, like a, like a massage aspect to it for the chairs and then nitrous oxide to, to help like curtail any fears. And then we also want to have computer monitors, like monitors for patient education. So the patient actually knows what they're getting involved in. That's great. Has anybody else explored um, other modalities that or have been effective or ones they'd like to if they had all the funding in the world? <laughs> we, uh, we recently um, added a bariatric chair to our clinic. Uh, so those patients who are wheelchair bound also can be treated. Um, the, the room had to be uh, built a little bit larger. And so our dental light is attached to the ceiling so that we actually can get a patient bound, a gurney bound also. The chair is easily moved out of the center of the room. So uh, that has been very helpful. Uh, students are able to treat patients uh, in the emergency, their emergency clinic. Um, that's just a little different. You know, it's just it's not your your traditional dental chair. Uh, and so they're we're teaching them how to, you know, kind of open their eyes and broaden their experiences with treating, you know, everyone, um, and no matter how they they present to your clinic. That, that's really great. One of the things that's, that's a basic is really cultural humility. So, you know, that we forget about that. Uh, things like translation services, simple things that we can do. And of course, we have technology now. So when we use this company with this iPad and you hand it to the patient and they're talking to a, a live person on the other end who's translating, we often forget that, especially with dental lingo, it doesn't always match a direct translation. So if you have like a staff member who speaks, you know, uh, some a language, let's say, uh, you know, Haitian language or Farsi or something, the words don't translate. So you really need someone who, who not only can translate, but has some type of dental or medical knowledge. So that's important. But the cultural humility is, is uh, really, you know, an important part. And I know I, I know most of you on the panel, and I know I know all of you, and I know that that's an important part of our programs to really get that message out. It's going to make them better providers, especially when you're in education when when they graduate. So, I have a yeah. bunch of notes. I learned a lot of good stuff here. Dr. York, uh, we had a question about engagement with dental school leadership and how that's going with your program. So it's engagement with dental school leadership? You know, the interest and support for um, this type of work. Oh, um, definitely. Yeah. I mean, that was one of our strengths in our program is organizational support uh, within Rutgers University. Uh, it's part of our mission. So we, we have four pillars. So we do, uh, you know, we're doing national presentations. We're doing research in the particular area, publications and scholarly input. Our clinical programs, not only in the community, but also at our proper in Newark is very thriving. We tr we're the only dental school in the state of New Jersey. Um, so we have that going for us as well. We do commu community service as one of our pillars. As I said, we're volunteering on different community uh, 
in partnership organizations. I myself sit in on an aid service organization, board of trustees, you know, trying to guide the narr narrative. And then education, all of our fourth year students rotate through the community for a minimum of 10 days. We also have a year long program. We test knowledge, attitudes and behaviors of our students. They do capstones. Um, it's a very thought out program and um, you really do need leadership and support in order for us to accomplish all that we can. So we do have that in New Jersey. Thank you. Um, we had a question about whether if there were any clinics or dental schools in California that are implementing this comprehensive oral health plan that was mentioned during the one of the presentations. If you're not aware, that's okay. We can, a project officer can help with that. Too far from the East Coast for most of us, I think. <laughs> Very fair. But I'm sure knowing their healthcare system, they probably have, you know, something probably pretty broad, I would hope, so. Well, those are all the questions in the chat. I believe I'll move forward with closing this session and thanking everyone for their participation as part of the HIV AIDS Bureau's efforts to provide you with timely topics and interesting speakers. We appreciate you filling out the session evaluations at the end of each session. If you're seeking continuation education credits, please complete the additional evaluation for credit. To access these evaluations, please return to the session page within the platform and click on the blue evaluation links. On the next screen, you will see a QR code. Please scan this code and our technical crew will guide you through the 2024 business day evaluation. Your participation is greatly appreciated. If you have already taken the evaluation, you do not need to take it again. Thank you again for joining, for our presenters, for this really informative session, and have a great time at the conference.